Number 1. The rapture is perhaps the most important prophecy for us to understand because it may have a personal impact on us. The term rapture itself does not appear in the Bible. The term rapture comes from the Latin translation of 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, which translates the Greek harpazo, to catch up or carry away, as repemir, from the Latin rapio. The Greek harpazo appears 14 times in the New Testament with four different meanings, each of which helps us understand what Paul is describing in verse 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. First, harpazo can mean to carry off by force. Christ will use his power to deliver both living and deceased believers from the final adversary, death. Second, harpazo can mean to claim for oneself eagerly. Christ bought us with his blood, and he will return to reclaim those who are his. Third, harpazo can mean to snatch away speedily. The rapture will take place in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. Fourth, harpazo can also mean to save from destruction. This interpretation supports the notion that the rapture will deliver the church from the terrors of the seven-year tribulation. This coming event is the first part of Christ's two-part return to earth. First, remove the church from the world. Second, seven years later, he'll establish his kingdom on earth. There are eight prophecies in the Bible about Christ's second coming for everyone about his first. The New Testament's 260 chapters contain 318 references to Christ's second coming. Will the rapture occur at Christ's second coming? The short answer is yes, but… The rapture initiates the end time events that will culminate in Christ's second coming. The rapture in return will be separated by a seven-year tribulation period on earth. According to Revelation 3 verse 10, the purpose of the rapture is to save Christ's own from the horrors of the tribulation. Three New Testament passages tell us about the rapture. John 14 verses 1 through 3, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50 through 57, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 18. Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians are the most complete and form the basis for this discussion. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind, who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 57. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul shared this revelation in order to address a practical concern of the Christians in Thessalonica. They were concerned about the fate of Christians who died before Christ's second coming in the timing of the rapture, whether it had already occurred. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 through 2, NIV. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The rapture, according to Paul, will occur in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52. The term twinkling most likely refers to the amount of time it takes for light traveling at 186,000 miles per second to be reflected on the retina of one's eye. The Lord will call believers to himself quickly. God's people from all ages, the disciples, the martyrs of the ages, your godly ancestors, and many more will rise from their graves at the rapture. Each of the three major passages teaching you about the rapture indicates that it is only for believers, including innocent children too young to believe. Anyone who does not believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior will not be raptured into the Lord's presence and will instead be subjected to the horrors of the tribulation. In John 14 verses 1 through 3, Jesus spoke to his disciples, who were clearly believers. He assured them that he would prepare a place for them in his Father's house. They, like Christians now, were members of the family of faith. John 14 verses 1 through 3 NKJV Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I will come again and receive you to myself, describes what we call the rapture, the uniting of Jesus Christ with his faithful followers. The rapture is restricted to believers. Only those who are followers of Christ will be taken up into heaven when he returns. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50 through 57 NLT What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then. When our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Three ways the rapture might affect our lives today. The rapture has the power to transform our lives. It is a source of personal comfort and hope. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians about it to ease their grief over their loved ones who had died. Death is not the end. Death's effects will be reversed by the resurrection of believers who have died. Everyone who has lost a loved one to the sting of death can find solace in the knowledge that they will see them again. It is, however, a source of strength. On the night he was arrested, Jesus promised his disciples that he would return for them. John 14 verses 1 through 3, NKJV. It's no surprise that Paul advised the Thessalonians to find solace in the truth about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 18. While we wait for the rapture, it can have three effects on our lives right now. First, we can live with this expectation. The letter from Paul to Titus expresses how we should live our lives in light of the rapture. Titus 2 verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Second we can live with dedication. Time was ticking away. We will not always have time to win souls for Christ or dedicate our lives to his service. Do not be ashamed before him at his coming, the apostle John exhorted his readers. 1 John 2 verse 28, the impending return of Jesus for his church 
is life's most powerful motivator for living a dedicated life. The Spirit of the Antichrist Now I would like to examine one of the main outworkings of Satan's kingdom, because it defines the core of our spiritual warfare. This, as we will see, is distinct from the one person called the Antichrist, who in turn is distinct from the many Antichrists that have arisen throughout history. This spirit and these persons are described primarily in the teaching of John. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy Spirit, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. 1 John 2 verses 18 through 20 Let me clarify the true meaning of the term Antichrist. The word Christ is from a Greek word Christos, which exactly corresponds to the Hebrew word Mashiach, from which we get Messiah. So when we say Antichrist, that means anti-Messiah. Anti is a Greek preposition. It has two meanings and both of them apply. First of all, it means against. So the first operation is against Messiah. The second meaning is in place of. The ultimate purpose is to replace the true Messiah with the false Messiah. The entire operation is therefore carried out in two phases. When you begin to realize this, you will see that the spirit of the Antichrist is extremely active in almost the entire confessing church. Further in John's teaching we read, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now, already is it in the world. 1 John 4 verses 2 through 3 If we look at this passage along with the passage quoted earlier, we see the three forms of Antichrist. For starters, there are many Antichrists. Throughout the history of mankind, many Antichrists have appeared and been manifested. Secondly, there is the Antichrist, a certain person. This is the last manifestation, the final product of the spirit of the Antichrist, at the end of this age. Scripture makes clear, there will be one last, most evil, most powerful ruler who will rule mankind for a short time, who will be the Antichrist. The third form is the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist is the spirit that works through every Antichrist. The closer we get to the end of the age, the more the spirit of the Antichrist is going to intensify, and the more we will find ourselves engaging it in battle. Identifying Marks of This Spirit John has given us four distinctive signs of the spirit of the Antichrist. These are of great importance. First and foremost, this spirit gets its start in association with God's people. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. 1 John 2, 19 First of all, then, this spirit of the Antichrist always begins in some way in connection with the people of God but it doesn't really belong there, and that will be revealed in due course. 
The second mark of this spirit is that it denies that Jesus is the Messiah. As we see in 1 John 2 verse 22, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? And then John continues with the third mark. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Remember this, the spirit of the Antichrist does not deny the existence of God. Indeed, the Antichrist will claim to be God's representative. What the Spirit does deny is the relationship of the Father and the Son within the Godhead. And the fourth mark of this Spirit, given in 1 John 4, is that it denies the Messiah has come. It probably believes in the Messiah who will come, but denies that the Messiah has already come. The Person Known as Antichrist The final manifestation of the Spirit of Antichrist will be the Antichrist. I want to examine some passages of Scripture so that you are not unaware of what Satan is planning. In 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul dealt with the emergence, revelation, and manifestation of the Antichrist. He also addressed preparation for the Lord's return. These actions are closely intertwined because the final satanic act before the return of the Lord will be the revealing of the Antichrist. Paul says, in fact, that the Lord will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 through 2 we read, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The word coming here is the word parousia in Greek, which is normally used for the second coming of Jesus. Paul wrote, Don't be shaken or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us. Because he knew that many Christians would be willing to believe certain predictions about the time of Jesus' return. Paul continued, Don't be deceived, as though the day of Christ had come, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 2 through 3 The term falling away in Greek is apostasia, meaning an apostasy, a deliberate rejection of revealed truth. This verse offers two titles of the Antichrist. First, he is the man of sin, a man of lawlessness. He is the supreme embodiment of man's rebellion against God and rejection of God's laws. He is also called the son of perdition, the one who is headed for a lost eternity. Judas Iscariot is the only other person in the New Testament who is called son of perdition. He was a false apostle. So we see three different names for the same being, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition. And we are given one other important name in Revelation 13, this part of the vision that John had. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Revelation 13, 1-4 Here we see the fourth title, the beast, a person who is going to arise to whom Satan, the dragon, will impart his power. Why will Satan give his power to that person? Because this will enable that person to gain dominion over the entire human race and convince all mankind to do the same thing Satan most desires, to worship him. That's his goal. 
He's been working patiently on it for many centuries, and he's very close to his achievement. Notice one of his heads has been mortally wounded and healed. There is a sort of false resurrection here. I do not know if this person will be assassinated, but he will apparently be dead and return to life. In his vision, John saw a scroll in the hand of God. But no one was found worthy to open it, so John was weeping. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Revelation 5, 5-6 through 6. John was looking for a lion, but the lion is a lamb. That is a deliberate contradiction. God's installed ruler does not have the nature of the beast. He has the nature of the lamb, and he is exalted above all others because he gave his life and he has humbled himself. He has walked in the way of meekness and humility, because he did not resist his arrests and persecutors. I believe that the church must show the same nature in these days. We have seen that the people worshipped the beast, and they all were convinced it was hopeless to make war with the beast. I am not certain what sort of circumstances will convince all the world that it is futile to fight back. When you consider the age of technology and weaponry in which we currently live, it is easy to believe that the situation pictured here could be close upon us. In Revelation 13, 6-7, we see the Antichrist take action. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. He is the open challenger of God. He is not a secret enemy. He shakes his fist in the face of Almighty God. And who do you think granted him permission to make war with and overcome the saints? I presume it is God, which is a very sobering thought. Let's never forget that Christianity is not all easy victory. Let's go further and look at verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. What a dramatic statement! The entire human race will worship him, except those God has chosen for himself. As that day approaches... Our battle plan then becomes clear. Look again at 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Through the centuries, there have been church leaders who were wicked, but they did not openly deny the great basic truths of the Christian faith. In fact, those truths were the means they used to support their power. But the 20th century saw church leaders deny the great basic truths of the Christian faith. The deity of Jesus, his virgin birth, his atoning death, his physical resurrection, and his return. I do not believe this existed in any previous century. I believe that we are already confronted with the apostasy. Keep in mind that the church is the bulwark against error. Satan has to penetrate the church before he can complete his plans. And he is not working alone. Fallen angels have interacted with humans throughout our history. Armageddon is mentioned specifically only once in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Despite its singular mention, the concept has taken on significant importance in our thought and imagination. 
Did you know that Armageddon is derived from the Hebrew Har Megiddo? Har meaning mountain and Megiddo, which all together means mountain of Megiddo. Megiddo itself is a historical site located in modern day Israel, known for its strategic importance and as a place of numerous ancient battles. However, in the context of Revelation, Armageddon is not just a physical location, but symbolically represents the final battle between the forces of good and evil before the end of the world. Story, Background and Origin When people hear the word Armageddon, they often think of big world-ending events. The name makes people think of a big fight between good and bad and is often used in movies and books to talk about the world ending. But this name actually comes from old stories and places from a long time ago in the Middle East. The connection between the apocalyptic Armageddon and the historical Megiddo is profound. This name wasn't picked randomly for the end times battle. It has a lot of history tied to that area's past troubles an ancient city with numerous battles. Megiddo was an ancient city located at a strategic crossroad in northern Israel, which connected the vital trade routes of Egypt to the south and Mesopotamia to the north. This geographical significance meant that whoever controlled Megiddo had a distinct advantage, both economically and militarily. Because of its strategic importance, the city became a focal point for many battles over the centuries. Notably, the Bible recounts one of the earliest recorded battles at Megiddo, where the renowned judge of Israel, Deborah, and her general Barak triumphed over the Canaanite king Jabin and his commander Sisera in Judges 5. In the ancient lands of Israel, Megiddo wasn't just any place. It was a crucial crossroad, a place where many battles happened. One of the most memorable battles there involved a fearless woman named Deborah and her loyal general Barak. And so, at Megiddo, through the faith and bravery of Deborah, Barak, and Jael, the Israelites saw the power of God at work bringing them victory against overwhelming odds. Later in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 15, King Solomon fortified Megiddo, along with Hazor and Gezer, recognizing its paramount strategic importance. Megiddo is a special place with a rich history. Think of it like an ancient crossroad city. It was so important because many big roads passed through it. Because of this, whoever controlled Megiddo could watch over and control these roads, making it a great spot for trade, travel, and military advantage. In the future, Megiddo would become famous for another reason. Many people believe it will be the site of a big future battle, often called the Battle of Armageddon. But that's another story. In short, Megiddo was like a major highway junction of the old times, and King Solomon made sure it was under his control. He knew its value, and that's why he made it stronger. Given its history as a battleground, it's not surprising that the prophetically inclined authors of the New Testament would draw upon Megiddo's legacy as a metaphor for the ultimate confrontation between good and evil. Its history is filled with battles and fights, which makes it a good symbol for the big final battle talked about in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 16 verse 16 where Armageddon is referenced comes after the pouring out of the sixth bowl of God's wrath which causes the Euphrates River to dry up, thereby preparing a way for the kings of the east to come. The he in this verse 
likely refers to an unclean spirit or spirits mentioned in the preceding verses. Revelation chapter 16 verses 13 through 14 which go forth to gather kings for battle. Revelation portrays a great end times conflict between the forces of God and the forces of evil. Armageddon in this narrative becomes the gathering place for the world's armies under the influence of the dragon, beast, and false prophet to wage war against God and his people. Revelation chapter 16 verses 13 through 14. This final showdown represents more than just a physical battle. It embodies the spiritual warfare that has raged throughout history, with Armageddon serving as the ultimate of this cosmic conflict. In the final days before the great battle of Armageddon, the world would bear witness to events unlike any in its history, unfolding in rapid succession. First, the rise of the Antichrist. The Antichrist, a charismatic leader endowed with supernatural powers, would emerge amidst political turmoil and societal decay. His rise would not be sudden, but rather a calculated ascent to power. He would be charismatic, persuasive, and offer solutions to the world's problems that would captivate nations. Even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9 This scripture makes it clear that the Antichrist's power and influence would be immense, but they would also be rooted in deception and evil. He would confirm a covenant of peace which would allow him to gain the trust of many nations according to Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. But this treaty, meant to last seven years, would be broken midway. This betrayal would lead to unprecedented persecution, especially towards those who oppose him and hold steadfast in their faith. The False Prophet and Deceptive Miracle as the Antichrist consolidates his power, another figure would emerge, often referred to as the false prophet. This individual would serve as the religious arm of the Antichrist's rule, directing worship towards him and enforcing his authority through religious means. The false prophet, as described in Revelation, would have great power to perform signs and wonders and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Revelation chapter 13 verses 12 through 13. These miracles, although astonishing, would be deceptive in nature. They would be used to convince the world of the divine nature of the Antichrist's rule, making dissent nearly impossible and leading many astray. One World Order With the rise of the Antichrist and the deceptive wonders performed by the false prophet, the world's kingdoms would gradually come under a single umbrella of governance. The Antichrist would control a global government, uniting nations as they had never been united before. The Bible speaks of ten kings or leaders who would give their power and authority to the beast, the Antichrist. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Revelation chapter 17 verses 12 through 13. While the world sees a time of unparalleled unity and peace, those with discerning eyes would recognize the underlying tyranny and spiritual bankruptcy. 
This unification, rather than being a sign of hope, would be the prelude to the final confrontation between good and evil at Armageddon. As the world moves closer to this ultimate battle, it would be crucial for believers to stay vigilant, grounded in their faith, and wary of the pervasive deception. The events leading up to Armageddon would test the faith of many, but they would also serve as a testament to the prophetic truths contained within the Bible. The Battle Itself The skies darken, and mysteriously, silence grips the earth. Over the plains of Megiddo, a vast army assembles. It's not just any army. It is the force of the Antichrist, people finally going against what God wants. These armies converge to make a last stand against the will of the Almighty. As tensions rise, a hush falls over the land. An impending storm is about to break loose. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Revelation chapter 19 verse 19. Suddenly, piercing the darkened sky, a radiant beam of light illuminates the horizon. And there, at the forefront, is a magnificent figure astride a white horse the embodiment of righteousness and justice. It is Christ, returning in all his glory. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Revelation chapter 19 verse 11. With Christ, a vast host of angels descends, their radiant wings sparkling in the dim light. Their presence signifies the might and majesty of heaven, standing in stark contrast to the dark forces below. Flanking Christ are the saints, those who had remained faithful to him throughout the ages. They too are on white horses, dressed in pure white linen representing the righteousness of the saints. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Revelation chapter 19 verse 14. As the battle of Armageddon commences, it is not like any other battle known to man. This is a battle between light and darkness, good and evil, the divine and the profane. The angels, wielding the power of heaven, clash with the forces of the Antichrist. The air is filled with the sound of swords and the cries of the fallen. But even in this fierce conflict, the might of the Antichrist and his armies is no match for the divine power of Christ and his heavenly hosts. With a word, Christ brings forth judgment, and the adversaries are struck down. The Antichrist and his false prophet are swiftly captured. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Revelation chapter 19 verse 20. The battle of Armageddon, foretold for ages, is swift. The forces of evil, though vast and intimidating, are destroyed in the face of divine intervention. With the Antichrist defeated, a new era dawns. Christ establishes his millennial kingdom, bringing peace, justice, and righteousness to the world. No matter how powerful the forces of darkness may seem, they cannot prevail against the omnipotent will of the Almighty. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil and Satan, 
and bound him a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20 verse 2. As the dust settles and the earth rejoices, one thing remains clear. The eternal reign of Christ has begun, and with it, a new chapter in the story of redemption and grace. Consequences of the Battle The Battle of Armageddon was not just a climax of warfare, but also a transformative turning point for humanity and the earth itself. Here, we delve into the profound consequences of this monumental event as depicted in the Holy Bible. Satan bound for 1,000 years, millennium. In the wake of Armageddon, one of the first and most immediate outcomes was the binding of Satan. Revelation chapter 20 verses one through three paints a vivid picture of an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seizes the dragon, the ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and binds him for a thousand years. What is Judgment Day? The day of God's final ultimate judgment on sinful society is known as Judgment Day. A number of passages in the Bible refer to the final judgment after death, when everyone will stand before God, and he will render final judgment on their lives. The Bible forewarns us about the day of judgment. Malachi 4, 1-6 Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. John the Baptist spoke of the need to flee from the coming wrath. Luke 3, 7, NIV John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Paul wrote to the unrepentant, Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person in proportion to what they have done. Psalm 62, 12, KJV Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. Romans 2, 5-6, NIV but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. Several times in the Bible, God passes judgment on individuals and nations. Isaiah 17.23, for example, is a series of judgments pronounced against Damascus, Egypt, Cush, Babylon, Arabia, Jerusalem, and Tyre. Isaiah 17, 1-6 A prophecy against Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. The cities of Aroah will be deserted and left to flocks, which will lie down 
with no one to make them afraid. The fortified city will disappear from Ephraim and royal power from Damascus. The remnant of Aram will be like the glory of the Israelites, declares the Lord Almighty. In that day, the glory of Jacob will fade. The fat of his body will waste away. It will be as when reapers harvest the standing grain, gathering the grain in their arms, as when someone gleans heads of grain in the valley of Rephaim. Yet some gleanings will remain, as when an olive tree is beaten, leaving two or three olives on the topmost branches, four or five on the fruitful boughs, declares the Lord, the God of Israel. These localized judgments serve to foreshadow the final judgment. God's judgment over the entire world is described in Isaiah 24. There is often a temporal judgment on sin in this life, but the final judgment will take place at the end of time. Revelation 19, 17-21 records a great war in which the adversaries of God are slain, and this may well be the image that most people think of when they think of Judgment Day. However, this is only a temporal judgment on the people alive at the time of the great battle. The final judgment will encompass everyone who has ever lived and will consign people to their final destiny. Revelation 19, 17-21, NKJV Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. One of the most vivid descriptions of Judgment Day can be found in Revelation 20, 10-15. Revelation 20, 10-15, NIV. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulphur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. This verse reveals that God is the supreme and ultimate judge. Since Jesus indicates that it is the Son who will preside over the last judgment, we can deduce that it is He who currently occupies the throne. John 5, 16-30, NKJV For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill Him, because He had done these things on the Sabbath, but Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. 
Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honour the Son just as they honour the Father. He who does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Revelation 7, 17, NIV For the Lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Additionally, it is clear that this evaluation is all-encompassing. This includes everyone who has ever passed away, both great and tiny, insignificant as well as significant. On the day of judgment, no one will be spared. On the day of judgment, people will be judged based on what they have done throughout their lives. In other words, they will be judged according to the works they have produced one will not be judged based on the actions or inactions of others. Rather, each individual will be held solely accountable for his or her own deeds in the eyes of the law. Even if the evaluation is based on one's works, it is not a contest in which good deeds are compared against evil. Whether or not our names are written down in the Book of Life determines, in the end, whether or not we are allowed admittance into paradise or hell. Those who do not have their names written in the book of life will be tormented in the lake that burns with fire forever. In Revelation 21:27, it is stated once again that the only people who will be able to enter the new heaven and new earth are those whose names are written in the book of life of the Lamb. It would behove one to make sure that he or she is prepared for the final judgment day in advance in view of the huge stakes involved, eternal destiny. How is it possible for a person who has sinned, and we all have, to have his or her name inscribed in the book of life of the Lamb, and for that person to thereafter be able to appear before God in the last judgment and be found not guilty? How is it possible for a sinner to be justified in the eyes of a holy and righteous God while still escaping his wrath? The Bible provides us with an unmistakable response. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1 Everyone who puts their trust in Christ will have their sins forgiven and their names will be recorded in the book that records the names of the righteous. They have nothing to worry about on the day of judgment, 
since Christ has already paid the price for their sins by bearing their punishment on the cross. Romans 8, 1, New King James Version There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Judgment Day will be the day of final salvation for those people who have trust in Christ, because on that day they will be saved from all of the negative effects that sin has had on them. Malachi 4, 2-3 NKJV But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise, with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Hebrews 9, 27-28 NIV Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Hebrews 9, 27-28 Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. The New Heaven and the New Earth Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Revelation 21.1 Revelation is one of the most difficult books in the Bible to understand. But while it is a challenge, cannot be ignored. God expects us to take the warning near the end of the book seriously. The theme and title of the book are revealed in the first sentence. The revelation of Jesus Christ refers to Christ's unveiling or disclosure of matters related to his second coming to earth. His servant, John, is the recipient of this information. The apostles frequently refer to themselves as God's servants because being dependent on and yielding to God is the most effective way to hear his voice. Indeed, as the Lord's servant, John received God's word and Jesus Christ's testimony. In Revelation 20, history as we know it is over at this point, and John begins to describe the eternal state in which believers will dwell. Unbelievers will exist in an eternal state that has already been described. Revelation 20 verses 14 and 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Believers will live in a new heaven and a new earth, because the first heaven and the first earth will pass away. I saw the holy God, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Revelation 21 verses 2 through 4. Right now, Christ dwells in a heavenly city with the souls of all believers who have died. John 14, 2-3 In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. During the millennium, God's people will live and work on the earth we know now, with their capital in Jerusalem, 
But after God destroys and makes the earth new, he's going to send that heavenly city down, out of heaven, to the new earth, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. That city will be known as the New Jerusalem and will serve as the capital for the new creation. And there, in the midst of his new creation, God will dwell and live with his people. As we live alongside our Creator, all sadness, hurt, and disappointment will be gone. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost, from the spring of the water of life. Revelation chapter 21 verses 5 through 6. The idea that God will make everything new may appear too fantastic to be true, but he claims that this promise is faithful and true. His people will be completely satisfied in the new creation, which is symbolized here by the metaphor of thirst being quenched from the spring of life's water. When you're thirsty, the refreshing satisfaction of downing a cold glass of water pales in comparison to the spectacular satisfaction that awaits you. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Revelation 21.7 Every saved person will live in the new creation, but the Christian who is fully committed, the one who conquers, will inherit an even greater reward, and God will dwell with him with greater intimacy, as a father does with his son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and the liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Revelation 21 verse 8. The description of heaven is interrupted by a brief reminder that those who continue to sin and rebel against God will spend eternity in the lake of fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Unbelievers with their unglorified bodies and unredeemed souls will enter a place where all of their problems from this life will be magnified with no hope of improvement. They will be imprisoned in the consequences of their sinfulness to varying degrees. One of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Revelation chapter 21 verses 9 through 11. One of the seven angels, who had been holding the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues, shows John the New Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 16 verses 1 through 21. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. The men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, 
and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial on the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the mighty devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief, Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into that place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And the men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. Although believers will live throughout the new creation, the angel directs John's attention to the capital of the new earth. This city will shine brighter than a cut diamond, because it will be adorned with God's glory. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and with twelve angels at the gates, on the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Revelation 21 verses 12 through 14. The city's massive wall symbolizes its inhabitants' identity. First, the names of Israel's twelve tribes' sons are inscribed on the gates indicating that Old Testament Israel believers will be present within it. Second, the city wall is depicted with twelve foundations, each with the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb written on it. This denotes the presence of believers from the New Testament era's church. The Lord's Old and New Covenant followers will coexist in the new creation. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and walls, the city was laid out like a square, as long as it is wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. Revelation chapter 21 verses 15 through 17. The angel measures the city, its gates, and its wall, revealing that it is a cube of 12,000 stadia in length, width, and height. A stadia is about 600 feet long, so each dimension of the city is about 1,400 miles long, roughly half the distance from New York to Los Angeles. The height is the most mind-boggling aspect of these dimensions. It's a multi-story city that rises, and it's only the capital of God's new creation. This city's wall will be 144 cubits thick, or about 72 yards thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold. As pure as glass, the foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl, 
The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. Revelation chapter 21, verses 18 through 21. The wall will be constructed of jasper, a transparent gemstone. The city will be made entirely of gold. The city's wall's foundations are to be adorned with every type of jewel. The list is incomprehensible. Each of the 12 gates will be made of a single pearl, and the city's main street will be made of pure gold. This is where we get the idea that in our eternal home, there are streets of gold, not of tar or cement, but of gold. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Revelation 21, 22. During the tribulation and millennium, there will be a temple in Jerusalem. However, there will be no temple in the New Jerusalem, because a physical representation of God's presence is no longer required. His direct presence will be with us. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will the gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Revelation chapter 21 verses 23 through 26. There will be no need for the sun or moon in the city because the glory of God will illuminate it, and its lamp will be the Lamb. Our sun is 93 million miles away, but its power is enough to illuminate the earth. God's presence, on the other hand, can easily replace the sun because the Lord possesses even greater power and radiance. The fact that there will never be night there implies that believers' glorified bodies will never tire and need to sleep. Furthermore, we will not become bored. On the new earth, nations and kings will function in a national context, bringing their glory and honor into the city. Everyone will visit the new Jerusalem as the pinnacle of their lives on the new earth. And why not, given its magnificence? Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation 21, 27 While the invitation to dwell in this city is universal, the requirements to enter are specific. Nothing unclean will ever enter into it, nor will anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, who have accepted Jesus as their Savior by faith.